Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm Francois Sells, and I am with Ping Identity. And um, I've joined Ping fairly recently, um, but prior to that, for, and for the last 17 years, I've been working on uh, API security-focused uh, solutions. Uh, and notably, I was the first developer at Layer 7 Technology and API Security Gateway uh, back in 2002, where I was the first developer. Um, and here are, here's what I want to talk about today. So, first of all, uh, API Security Matters. Uh, I'm going to argue that API Security Matters. Uh, you are being breached, and your foundational API Security is just not cutting it. And finally, I want to talk about how you can apply artificial intelligence to augment that uh, foundational API security. So I'm guessing that a, uh, you know, a pretty large subset of the people in this room you know, have a, a, um, a mature appreciation for why API security is important. Um, but we all deal well with stakeholders that don't necessarily have this appreciation. Um, for a lot of people, the API is an implementation detail and does not necessarily warrant its own uh, security focus. And so this is how I like to describe why API security is important, and that's that hackers use your API outside of your app, meaning your client app, right? If, if you do security testing from an end-to-end -end perspective, you're missing a lot because when you take the client-side app out of the equation, it opens up a whole bunch of, of untested for and, and unexpected scenarios. And, and, and if you're not testing at the API layer directly, you are now in, in the complete blind spot. And hackers, uh, uh, skip that application, it allows them to poke around and find vulnerabilities in your APIs. And if you think about, you know, a lot of the breach reports that are coming out, you know, on a very uh, uh, regular basis, it, it turns out that breaches go undetected for months and sometimes years. So, you know, if you think, for example, of Marriott, you know, in, in which there was a, a breach that went on for four years and not detected. If, if you think back of what it was like at Marriott for those four years, you know, it looked like that thing on the left, but what was actually happening was that the house was on fire. And the reason I say that is that, you know, you should not assume, you basically should assume from that, you should infer from that, that, you know, some of us are probably being breached right now and we're just not aware of it. So I encourage the community to start looking at these types of breaches proactively, you know, from the perspective of, I'm probably being breached right now, there's a pretty high probability, so let's go out and look for it. And the impact of an API breach can be very severe. Uh, customers' accounts are taken over. Um, industrial control systems taken over, right? Think about the electric grid being taken over, or a transportation system, right? This, this is national security level uh, uh, a severity, if you like. If you're, if you're an application provider, your application is disrupted or completely shut down. Uh, the theft of customer records, which have implications with privacy regulations that are increasingly on our, on our, on our case for that. Uh, if you're in the financial sector, frauds, ransoms get paid to hackers, jobs are lost. So for the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about you know, a, a, a few basic examples of how API security uh, goes wrong sometimes these days. Uh, standing, uh, starting with uh, Landmark White, uh, which is a very recent uh, breach that uh, I think that, that came out in February. And basically what happened there is that they had an API that was, that was meant to be an internal API, and it may, probably it was, presumably it was an internal API for a long time, but somehow it made its way uh, to the outside world, um, and that fell through cracks because it just came out to the outside world completely insecure. 
Um, and, and Landmark White is the main property valuer in Australia. So in this case, property valuation details were leaked, contact information was leaked, and a lot of banks that were, deal were, were working with Landmark White for this type of information had to scramble to look for alternatives, and they wanted to disassociate themselves with Landmark White. The C CEO resigned. Uh, I'm not sure if he's actually still looking for work. Um, but that, that's an example of an API falling through the cracks. And a few months before that, we all heard about the USPS API incident where, you know, it wasn't quite as much a lack of security, right? There was at least a little bit of authentication going on. So user A would get its information through the application. There was an API that was being called. There was a token that was validated. User B was getting their information. But it turns out that as long as you had a valid token, in this case, if you were skipping the application, you can get anybody's information. And that, that's a prime example of the whole concept of skipping the application, right? You can't do that through the application. It's really by going directly at the API that you are able to uh, find and exploit this vulnerability. And this is a pretty common pattern, right? It happened at USPS, and a very similar uh, vulnerability had happened at T-Mobile and Verizon and a bunch of other ones. Here's one of my favorite. Um, so, so, and I'm not gonna say who this was, but there was a, you know, a team was tasked with developing a new REST API, right? So, so very nice REST API, JSON schemas are defined, and uh, you know, developer-friendly authentication schemes and, and authorization rules, and a whole bunch of different rules are defined. At implementation time, people take this list of requirements, and okay, we're gonna just build this on top of an existing legacy XML service, maybe like a SOAP service or something like that, that, that nobody's using, right? This, this, this ugly service, maybe it was part of an SOA thing that, that we've had in there. Um, and then, all right, they, they, they do the testing, and they test according to the new requirements, right? The, the, the schemas, the authorization rules, everything's tested, looks good, it deploys. Um, who, who thinks that they know what's coming next? Yes. Right, you, you see this all the time. So basically, you know, somebody that had the knowledge of that legacy XML format figured out that by sending that to that, that, that new modern API, you would just completely skip that, that new layer, right? So that's what I call an abstraction layer gone wrong. Obviously there was some, you know, there was, that's a bug, that's a bug, but if you think about the security testing team, they're not aware of this legacy XML format. That's not part of the requirements. That's an implementation detail. So how are they supposed to know and catch that, right? So that's a huge uh, blind spot. And if you think about all the people doing that type of you know, modern sheen on top of a legacy service, you can imagine how maybe you have a similar uh, vulnerability that, that's possibly happening in your own application. So, so far, you know, this is the kind of like OWASP top 10 that, that your existing foundational API security should be catching, but is not necessarily catching it for a number of reasons. Um, but there are other things that you need to worry about. You know, sometimes the vulnerability is not on the API directly. Sometimes the API, the, the vulnerability is on the user, for example. Maybe you got a gullible user and they're being tricked into a phishing attack and uh, a malicious uh, attacker is interjecting its own application into a handshake, like an OAuth handshake, and then they get a token that's meant for a legitimate application, and then they use that to call an API, which they're not supposed to. And there's lots of indirect ways that people will steal tokens. Um, and and uh, recently, there was a, a, a really, um, high profile story about GitHub leaking a whole bunch of client secrets, right? Tokens, API keys, and things like that. Uh, I'm sure you guys saw that. Uh, and client applications are notoriously bad at keeping secrets, right? So sometimes the vulnerability is a client application. And sometimes as an API provider, you have zero control over that. So what are you supposed to do there, right? The, the vulnerability is on the client application, but the victim is your API. <laughs> 
users do password reuse. And from previous breaches, hackers go on the dark web and they get a collection of credentials from these past breaches, and then they password spray that on your system and they get a few hits, get a few tokens that way. Uh, default passwords. Uh, remote access trojans, things that will sniff out passwords in memory, right? Those are all vulnerabilities outside your API that are then exploited at your API. So if you can't trust your own tokens, what are you supposed to do? This is where your foundational API security is, you know, outside of its comfort zone, if you like. And that leads me to talk about what are some of the limitations of that foundational API security? So I've talked about some APIs that fall through the cracks, bugs, and things like that. And you can have some very meticulous security practices in place to minimize that, but the risk of those is never fully zero. So you need to account for that. A human expertise deficit. The previous speaker was talking about, you know, lack of developers and things like that. If you think about you know, those specialized API security tools, they, they can do some very sophisticated rules checking and, and things like that. But every, every, every single one of those features, if you like, require a human to configure them. And we're talking about humans that understand your API, humans that understand your, your application, your API infrastructure, understand security, you know, and, and how many times are we hearing you know, oh my God, John is awesome. I, I really wish I could clone John. I need 10 of them, right? There's a shortage of those people in our organizations. And then I've talked about vulnerabilities on external components. You can't blame the API for that, but the API is the victim. And then finally, uh, API gateways and those types of tools are real-time security focus, right? An API request comes in, and, and you look at it, and okay, should, should that go through or not? You need to make a decision, right? But some attacks aren't detected that way. Some attacks require you to look at what's happening over time. That, that's different from real-time security. And real-time security is important, and those tools are doing this as they should be, uh, but sometimes that is not sufficient. And that leads me to talk about artificial intelligence. <clears throat> And there's lots of different types of artificial intelligence, right? We're not talking about natural language processing here or robots and visions and things. This is really about machine learning. And what machine learning does is it builds a mathematical model using big data to make a prediction about a new input. So in this case, the big data is your API traffic. And, and so you can build a mathematical model using machine learning by learning what your API traffic looks like when it's issued from your legitimate applications. And remember what I said earlier, hackers use your APIs outside of those applications. And that's how you can catch them. So the idea is that at runtime, you compare the API traffic coming through with that model that you've generated, and you're looking for deviations from that model, and then you can use that to block what is predicted to be either a compromise token or an API abuse outside of a legitimate application. And then you can block, you can notify, you can alert, you can take action. So the benefits here is that you are helping you remediate this, this uh, human uh, uh, expert deficit, if you like, right? There's very minimal human input required for this type of system to give you this added layer of protection. The input is API traffic. You know, it's there for you to mine, and so you should take advantage of that. And, and minimal human input doesn't mean that there's no human control it just means that you don't need that human input to get started, to, to learn, and then to, to, to make predictions. It augments your existing API security. So it catches things that you might have missed in that foundational API security layer, or some of it. It catches breaches that are otherwise undetectable in that foundational API security layer. 
And because of the big data that you're getting out of your API traffic, it also has the benefit of giving you insights on your API traffic. It's not just about security. For example, you can uh, infer from this you know, the health of your API backends. So here's a practical application. Um, so you've got your API traffic going through an API gateway. Uh, a hacker comes in and reverse engineers your API because it's not just about public APIs, right? It's about your private APIs as well. And so what we do is we attach this AI layer to your existing API gateway. So uh, what we do at Ping is we have this thing called the ASC, which is a, a sidecar, if you like, to your API gateway. It collects metadata about your API traffic and it feeds that to an AI engine out of band, which is important for, you know, we don't want to mess your latency. Um, and then at runtime, we start making predictions. And if we do look like something that is compromised, then we go back to the API gateway and we can block that offending requester. Or we can maybe just flag it. Sometimes you want to run this in unblocking mode for a while. You can do that. But you get that information, those notifications, and you can block that requester at this level. And it's not just about blocking. It's about what you do after the attack has been detected and blocked. You want to be able to go back and, 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 and repair the damage that has been caused by the attack. And in, in order for you to do that, you need information about what were the actions that this hacker took before, prior to the detection and the blocking. You want to inform which specific users are affected by that. There's regulations that require you to do that. And, and people will launch month-long investigations and, and, and very complicated process to get to the bottom of this. But by having this analytics on your API traffic, you're able to uh, accelerate that because you get the forensics of exactly all the things that happen up to that point. Another strategy that we use, and this one is arguably not machine learning uh, uh, based, is API deception, right? So remember, AP hackers has this, have this tendency to poke around in your APIs, look for vulnerabilities and things like that. So you can use this hacking behavior against the hackers because your applications don't do that. So using honeypots, uh, API deceptions, if, if a hacker falls into that trap, you know, we go from, you know, we talked about months that it takes to detect a, a, a breach, you know, through machine learning, bring that down to minutes, maybe seconds, to more of a real-time detection using something like that. So you can return like a 200 okay uh, on these honeypots uh, but then as soon as a hacker is trying to hit a legitimate application, you know it's a hacker, you stop him right away. So trying not to turn this into a product pitch, so this is my last slide about Ping Intelligence for APIs. This is the name of our product. Uh, we are integrating with those foundational API security solutions that I've mentioned, some of which are represented at the conference today. I know that Axway's here, IBM's here. Uh, for example, but we, we integrate with a lot of those solutions. Uh, we have a booth here in the back, and, and we'd love to talk to you guys about pilling intelligence for APIs. And I am finishing on time. Thank you. <laughs>